Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Ken Van Vliet, and I'm the senior pastor here at Monta Vista Chapel. And I am the host for the service today. And what that means is one of the things the service host does is to welcome you. And so that's what I'd like to kick off with is a hearty welcome from Monta Vista Chapel. We are so glad that you are joining us, whether that's here in the sanctuary or whether that's live in Turlock or anywhere else in the world. Um, we just want to extend a special welcome to you. Also, we want to let you know that we have a new website that's gone live this weekend. And so if you want to check that out at mvcturlock.com, you'll be able to get a lot of information about who we are and what we're doing. So welcome. The second thing that the service host does is once we welcome you in, we want to draw your attention to God because ultimately that's why we are here. And we usually do that through something called a call to worship. And in light of all that has happened this past week and really this past year, uh, I believe we need a call to worship uh, more now than ever. You see, worshiping someone isn't just about singing songs to them or about them. The reality is we serve and worship a whole lot of things that we don't sing to or about. See, to worship someone is to align ourselves with them. To worship someone is to be about the same things they are about. So in light of this past week and really this past year, I would like to offer a call to worship that I've been reflecting on. And to do that, I ask you to stand to your feet wherever you are. This call to worship, a call to align ourselves with Jesus. So Jesus, Son of God, Master, Savior, Lord, we are mindful of our call to bring your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Yet the many disturbing events of this past week and year illustrate that we have fallen short, very short, and we would like to do better. We must do better for your name's sake and for the sake of the world you love. So we begin our worship, our aligning ourselves with you with repentance for uncharitable thoughts and unkind actions, for oppression and injustice in all its ugliest forms, racism, sexism, abject poverty, the killing of the unborn, for choosing political loyalty above kingdom faithfulness, for thinking that you might favor our nation above any other for excusing behavior that makes you weep because it may serve our own personal agenda, for looking to people or causes for deliverance rather than to you, and for pointing out the speck in another's eye all the while ignoring the log in our own. And it's not working out very well. Hatred and division fill the air, and we want it to be different. We want to change. We need to change, and so we commit to worship you by looking in the mirror before pointing fingers, by trusting that your way, truth, and life are the only real means of deliverance, by never excusing our behavior because someone else may have behaved that way towards us, by promoting and reflecting your love for all nations and all peoples, by choosing your kingdom over our own political party or any of its leaders, by standing against oppression and injustice in word and deed, against racism, against sexism, against greed, against murder, and by treating others as the glorious image bearers of God that they truly are. And to worship you in this way, we know we will need your grace first for ourselves and then for others. So Jesus, grant us that grace that in receiving it, we would be compelled to worship you more. We pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
This song has been an invitation to open my eyes and my heart to allow God's love to broaden my perspective. The song says, the empty filled, the wounded healed, the broken back together. 
Then later it says, the outcast known, the orphan home. You are my redeemer. Behold what love can do. He is making all things new. Oftentimes I can be so focused on my own circumstances when I feel empty, wounded, broken, or like an outcast. And in those times, it is helpful for me to be reminded of God's redeeming love, exemplified in my story and in the stories of people close to me. A love that fills us, heals us, and restores us. A love that reminds us that we are fully known and we fully belong. So this morning, as we proclaim these promises in worship, may we hear the invitation, whatever our circumstances may be, to open our eyes and behold what love can do, how he is making all things new.
Amen. And Father, we are reminded of your greatness and uh, your grace every day, no matter what's going on around us, no matter what our circumstances we find ourselves in, no matter what we see when we turn on the TV, we can be reminded of your greatness. We can be reminded of your grace, that you are for us always and by our side. May we rest in that knowledge in your presence. I pray this, and everyone said, amen. And you may be seated, and uh, a good morning to you. I'm grateful to be with you this morning, to be able to be here uh, in service with you, and to be with you online uh, as you join us, wherever you're joining us from. And we are going to continue in our series this morning, Your Kingdom Come. We're talking about the kingdom of God. What is it? Who's it for? What's it all about? And we're spending most of our time in the Gospel of John in an effort to really join with Jesus and see how his life, this kingdom, how he modeled it and how he brought it to earth and how we can participate in expanding that kingdom here in our own community, in our own lives, in our own family. I say we're spending most of our time in the Gospel of John because really in order to get a full picture of Jesus' life and ministry, you kind of have to go to some of the other Gospels, and well, that actually is going to happen this morning. We're going to be spending some time in Matthew, but uh, 
we're going to be talking about Jesus' baptism this morning. And while John certainly notes that Jesus was baptized, that was really kind of about it for John. He does say, you know, he's the Lamb of God, which will take away the sins of the world. But we need to travel to another gospel this morning, to the gospel of Matthew, so we can read about what took place. And I I want you to open your Bibles, if you have it, have it, will be in Matthew chapter 3. But what I really would love for you to do, because this is a great passage to do it, is picture yourself as I read the passage, picture yourself in the scene. Like, if you have to close your eyes, close your eyes. But as I read, I just want you to picture yourself, what might it have been like to have been on the banks of the Jordan River? To smell kind of that wet grass to hear the rustling of the water, to hear the, the, maybe the small uh, rustling of the crowd talking about what was going on. Picture yourself, put yourself in the scene as I read it. Let me read Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. So John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, resting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I'm well pleased. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine being on that countryside, outside Bethany, on the banks of the Jordan River, and you got to witness this thing? This is one of those jaw-dropping moments in scriptures, people. If you were there, or could picture yourself there. The heavens open up, Jesus goes into the water much like a death, and then as he's resurrected from the water, which is what baptism often represents, right? The heavens open, whatever that would look like, the heavens open up, and the spirit descending like a dove alights, rests on, find its home on Jesus, and then you hear a voice. I mean, this is an audible voice. And not only do you hear this voice, what it says, this is my son, oh my goodness, and I love him, and I'm well pleased with him. That must have been quite the scene. Now, what if I were to tell you this, that that scene represents three very powerful movements in a believer's life that are key for participating and expanding God's kingdom here on earth. Now, I don't necessarily think Jesus set out to say, okay, I'm going to get baptized, and by me being baptized, this is what it's going to represent for everyone. But I think we see these movements or these actions or how we can participate that are important for our life, uh, our integrated life as a believer. Because we are, after all, on mission with Christ. This is about our vocation. Like underneath our jobs and our activities is the call for humanity to partner with God in bringing about his good in a just and loving way in this world. We're God's agents of shalom. Ken likes to say we're building little islands of shalom in our families, at our workplace, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, ultimately in the world. This is what it means to expand the kingdom of God. And so, if we're open to it this morning, let's see what these movements, these ways of engagement. Let's see how we can find that in the baptism of Christ. Because I don't know if you're anything like me, but I have felt very disconnected my life as of late, I would say the past year, as a matter of fact. We have a society, a government world telling us right now we're actually to distance ourselves and disconnect from one another because it's safe. And while I understand and get that, It's not what it means uh, that we're to disconnect out of relationship. It means physically. But I know for me, um, because I am such a physical, in-person person, person, uh, it can lead to a disconnect. 
Actually, I think the world fosters this a lot. Um, different areas of my life feel s- segregated and separated into all these little categories. Um, I have a family life. I try to be a good father to these little humans that call me dad, right? Uh, and yet the world has its way of saying, well, this is how you should actually parent them. Well, I'm, I want to do it the way that uh, Christ would have me do it, but the world tells me that I should do certain things. Timeouts not good for your kids. Timeouts are good for your kids. This is 2021, so spanking's like out of the question. That's like a barbaric thing. And right, the state owns my kids more than I do, but don't get me started on that. I try to have my life as a husband to Heather, and yet the world has a lot to tell me about that too, ways that I should or should not take care of my family or be a husband to my wife. What about my work relationships and my work life? I try to do a good job, try to earn some money for my family, I try to support them, I try to, uh, yeah, minister to you, our congregation, and do so with authenticity and transparency, and yet, you know there are even blogs and emails and things that we get every week that tell us how we should or could do church even better than we are now. And so all these voices are telling us things that we should or shouldn't do. What about my social life? I don't really have a social life, so I could skip that one. But my spiritual life even. The world tells us how we should be spiritual or what we should align ourselves with or not align ourselves with. And I find myself in this kind of disintegrated life where all my life, little parts of my life feel disconnected. And yet Christ says, I want all of you. I want your whole life, not just part of you. And as a believer, I find that uh, all these competing voices can lead to a lot of chaos, a lot of anxiety. It's easy to disintegrate or live more disconnected than I would prefer. For Jesus, it's interesting though. I think he felt this too. He was going to enter a public ministry filled with that which would try to deter him from being who he actually was. He was supposed to be something that everyone wanted, and what they wanted was all sorts of different. And so for us too, how are we to imagine living in a world that tries to make us doubt who we are and tell us how to live that may feel incongruent with what Christ wants? But here's what's encouraging us, uh, encouraging for us this morning. Jesus' baptism gives us a little bit of a, a picture or an example that can help bring Christ into the center of our lives and keep us integrated and connected. So let's see if we can unpack this just a little bit more. As Jesus is getting baptized in Matthew chapter three, right, this is the very beginning of his public ministry. Up until this point, in the first three chapters of Matthew, there's a a lot has taken place. We don't have a lot in the Bible of what uh, we see in Jesus' childhood, but we do know this that Jesus has been divinely commissioned from conception to manifest God's saving presence. He will be the one to save the world. We know he was born of Mary. He was threatened by a murderous king, homage by the Magi. He was neglected by the Jerusalem leaders, protected by Joseph. He was attested by the scriptures and guided by God and witnessed to by John. These chapters have established Jesus as God's anointed agent, Christ, son of David, Emmanuel, king of the Jews. And in his baptism, Jesus, in his first action as an adult, affirms his identity and his own commission. And this is key, because not only God bears witness in verbalizing Jesus' identity as God's son, but Jesus affirms his own role in God's larger redemptive story. Plainly speaking, Jesus knows he's part of something really, really big. And this is one of those first movements or first uh, action that Jesus engages in that I think is important for us to remember as well. Jesus is grounded in the larger story of God. History, his story, the larger story of God. And this gives Jesus true direction in life. In verse 15, right, Jesus comes from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized. John's like, no, I, don't, I shouldn't have anything to do with this. I should be baptized by you. But Jesus re- replies, let it be so now, for it's proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. 
The conversation between John and Jesus that's missing from the other gospel clarifies the significance of Jesus' baptism. Jesus imposes his authority with his demand for immediate baptism, let it be now. And he follows with the explanation that this is to fulfill righteousness. And to fulfill means it's to signal the circumstances of Jesus' life according with and to enact God's will. Like this is meant to happen because it's part of something larger. Jesus' baptism expressed his commitment to live within that story, to be an agent of God's saving presence. It's this larger story that gives true direction to Jesus. I asked the question a little bit earlier, how was Jesus able to imagine walking into a public ministry filled with that which would try to deter him from being who he was? Well, he was grounded in something. He was grounded in the fact that he was part of something bigger. I mean, it's no surprise that right after his baptism, the Spirit leads him into the wilderness to what? Be tempted, right? And Jesus is able to refute those temptations and stay strong because not only he knew who he was, but he knew what he was being called to do. And the same goes for you and I. We want you to discover your place in the greater story of God and how that can give meaning and purpose and direction to our everyday activities as well as our entire life. It's our desire to know the story of God through history, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and to know how that story impacts the entirety of our lives. And then we're dedicated to faithfully passing that story on to our kids and to our community. It's important knowledge, but it's not just for knowledge's sake. It's a knowing which gives us an anchor and grounds us. The larger story is something we need not just to learn, but to be reminded of and to re-remind ourselves on a regular basis. That's why we see this movement in Jesus as not a one-time action, but an, an ongoing thing. A good question is, do you know where your life, specifically your life, fits within the larger story of God? But it's not just where Jesus fits in the larger story that was significant. I mean, at least not on its own. Let's go back to our passage. Verse 16, as soon as Jesus was baptized and he went up out of the water, at that moment, the heavens open up. And he sees the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven says this, this is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. Jesus just wasn't grounded in the larger context of what was going on around him. Jesus was grounded in his identity as God's beloved son. And this gave, I mean, it gave him an empowering identity. John's baptizing activity provides the occasion in which Jesus expresses the commitment and confirmation of, a, of his identity, right? But we see that God also declares Jesus' identity in the first person, right? This is my son. I'm well pleased with him. I love him. He is suitable for this role, and he is exactly in the right spot that I want him. Church, in Jesus' baptism, we see the joy of the Lord coming into the world. Being attentive uh, to the crucial aspects of joy, we can see how foundational this event was for Jesus and his ministry. It's interesting because um, the account of Jesus' baptism from Luke says this way. It says that when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying... Jesus was praying as he was baptized. The heaven was opened up and the Holy Spirit descended on him. And a voice from heaven said, you are my son with whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. Luke's the only one that notes that Jesus was praying while he was baptized. I think that's pretty cool. Jesus was pursuing a relationship with his father, even in that moment. And then the heavens were opened and the presence of God comes down. And the pleasure of God was expressed in the voice of the Father to his Son. I mean, Jesus, if he wasn't already, is filled with joy because his, he experiences the presence of God through the Spirit and the pleasure of God through the voice of his Father. 
Jesus lives within the joy of the presence of the Father and of the Spirit. Cheryl Fleischer, uh, who we know around here, says Jesus is probably the most joyful person on the planet. We don't often think that about Christ. As a Kurt Thompson said, he says, before Jesus even began to behave in a pleasing manner, he sensed the presence of God, and that presence was dominated by a sense of pleasure with him. Man, to feel that type of pleasure, I think, makes all the difference in who we are as people. Because I know when I sense that I am truly God's beloved, when I'm truly loved and accepted, without shame, without pretense, changes things for me. I think this is why Jesus spent so much time in solitude with his Father, to to continually remind himself and be reminded of his Father's pleasure and his love for him. It was a regular practice of Jesus' life, a regular movement, something that he engaged in, We see all throughout Scripture that Christ, even uh, after significant events or even before the crucial ones, would spend time in prayer with his dad, probably being reminded of his true self. Jesus was able to stay his most true self because of his experience with being loved. And isn't that true with you and me? Brennan Manning says in Abba's Child, I cannot be defined by ever-changing seasons around me, nor can I be guided only by the voices that come from within me. Rather, my identity must continue to be found in the love of my creator himself. I'm loved, he writes, deeply loved. And when I let that love define who I am, I'm suddenly free to be myself. When you and I are free to be our true selves without fear of rejection and without fear of being dismissed or shamed, we're then most free to live the type of life Jesus really desires us to live. Where love of God and love of neighbor can be fully realized. I know for me, if I'm honest, when I am living apart or distracted from that message in life, And uh, apart from the fact that uh, I don't feel like God's beloved, I tend to to live my life with a different type of agenda. And oftentimes it's an agenda where I'm trying to feel loved and accepted by those around me because that need to feel loved and accepted is something at our core. I tend to work harder at my job so I can get an attaboy or place expectations, hidden, unspoken ones, on my family, my wife, for appreciation or respect, and end up doing things trying to get something rather than just out of service. Then I can get resentful when I don't get it. But when I'm spending regular time with the Trinity, regular time with Christ, who replaces those messages that I actually have to work for love, and they get replaced with the reality that I am truly loved, man, I'm free to serve my family. I'm free to work hard and diligently. I'm most suddenly free to be me. And this actually leads me to pursue this third movement that we see in Jesus' baptism. We actually see that Jesus was grounded so he could fulfill the mission that he was called to do. So not only do we see him um, grounded and anchored in the fact that he was part of a larger story, Not only do we see and experience the fact that he's grounded because of his love uh, by the Father and how that brings identity, but he's grounded so he can fulfill this mission and he's given ultimate resource in the Holy Spirit. Verse 15 says, Let it be so now. It's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. All righteousness. All justice. It expresses actions that are consistent with or faithful to a relationship or commitment to God. God is just or righteous, for example, when God acts consistently with God's covenant and commits to delivering the people from exile. God acts. He's on mission to do that. And so to act justly or to faithfully or righteously is to act in accordance with God's will. It's to act in kingdom ways. Jesus' baptism then signifies Christ's commitment to act faithfully to God, his God-given commission. That saving presence that the angel announced to Joseph concerning Joseph, uh, Jesus' conception, right? He will save the world. This is why he came. 
Jesus' commitment to enact God's saving purpose faithfully is the fruit that John calls for, turning or committing to God's purposes. So John consents and baptizes Jesus. It's interesting because some ask the question, why would Jesus need to get baptized anyways? Right? Isn't a baptism mean repent? Repent of what? Sin. I thought Jesus was sinless. Why would Jesus need to get baptized? Well, it's pretty interesting because while that Greek word metanoia does mean repent, uh, to acknowledge one's sin and to turn the other way, another translation of that word also means to change your mind or to, to change how you see things. Repent then. Change how you're looking at the world. Change how you would normally view things because there's a different way to see it. The call for you and I is as we surrender or repent our whole lives to the kingdom of God, it's a call to see things differently than the world sees them, to see people and to see the world through a kingdom lens. It's as Ken, you so eloquently said at our call to worship, um, to call out injustice when injustice is done, to speak God's truth in love to a world that so desperately needs to hear it. It's to see our neighbor through an a unprejudiced lens, to see them as God's beloved, just as we are. It's to practice radical hospitality, welcome the stranger, welcome the alien, treating them with respect and grace. It's expanding God's kingdom. Then this is the mission that Jesus is on, and this is our mission as well. Why did Jesus need to be baptized? Well, he wanted to go first to show us how it's done, to help us see things differently, a call to a kingdom way to live. Now, I don't want to get into any debates here, but it's completely unclear according to Scripture if Jesus was empowered or indwelt with the Spirit before this time. We just don't know. Scripture just doesn't say. We know he grew in wisdom and stature, and that could very well be obviously the work of the Spirit, but we do know this. What we know is that scripture tells us that the spirit descends on Jesus and rested with him. And from here on out, Jesus would begin his public ministry. That word alight means to find its place or to find its home with Christ. And this is the way it works with you and me as well. We are resourced just as Jesus was resourced with the spirit of God on us and in us. Get this. There was no more of the Spirit within Jesus than is also within you and I. Jesus didn't have more of the Spirit available to him than you and I do. We have exactly the same. And because the Spirit gave us access to the fruits of that Spirit, we have just as much access to the love, to the joy, to patience, to kindness, self-control, the same amount that uh, uh, Jesus had access to, we do too. And that's a pretty amazing thing to think about. And that's what Jesus' baptism reminds us about. And so we see these three movements, these activities, knowing where we fit into the larger story of, of God that really gives us direction, knowing our identity as the beloved, which frees us to be ourselves, and then being resourced by the Spirit to be on mission with Christ. Here's another final thing that I just kind of want to note about Jesus' baptism. Why would Jesus choose to get baptism? Well, or baptized? Because it was a highly communal thing. Think about the countryside. When John was out baptizing people, I mean, this wasn't like a couple people here and a couple people there. Like, he... He was popular. When he was baptizing, there was the good possibility that there could have been hundreds of people that were out lining the banks of the Jordan, seeing what was going on on a regular basis. Repent, be baptized. And Jesus, in the middle of this, walks up to John and says, I have to partake of this. Jesus essentially was saying, I want to be the example. I'll go first. I'll show you the way, show you how it's done. I think it was Caden uh, when we were in Valencia. 
They had the community pool, and the community pool, the aquatic center, had the uh, diving pool as well. And so there was the uh, one meter, the three meter uh, platform uh, dives, diving boards and all that kind of stuff. And I remember the kids being little. Sam, you know, our eight, he just would, he didn't care. He'd climb up and jump off. And dad, I learned how to do a flip. I'm like, I don't even have like my towel off yet, right? Like he just is going crazy. And I know Max was one of those things where it was like, this looks fun. He'll just jump off no matter what. But I think it was Caden who was always so very hesitant. And so trying to be, you know, a good father, what do we do? I'll go first, all right? Climb up and jump in and then sit there in the pool and tread water for like a half hour while he climbs up and peers over the end and says, can I do it? Can I go? Yes, you can go. Like, I'm here. I'll catch you. You'll be fine. This is the picture that I have with Jesus and his baptism. Did he need to be baptized? I don't think he needed to besides to fulfill what he came to do. But he chose to. In the public's eye, with everyone watching, essentially saying, I know what it's going to take for you to live this life, and I'm going to go first. I'm going to go ahead of you and show you an example and show you that it can be done so that you can follow in my footsteps. I know it's hard, but I'll go first. I know homeschooling is hard right now, but I've gone before you, I know how to do hard things, and you do too. I know that being a parent is hard right now. I know that unemployment is hard right now. I know the political scene is hard right now, but I've gone first so that you can live life according to the kingdom. That's what Jesus' baptism means to me. The song we sang earlier, I really resonate with that new one. Look what love can do. Might be that thing that we need to hold on to in this season. As we look at Jesus bringing the kingdom and his example of, of baptism, love says, I'll go into the water first. Love says, I'll go first so that you can follow. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. Father, thank you for our time this morning. Thank you that we have this beautiful picture of your baptism, that we can um, follow your example, that we can see how you were grounded in the larger story of your father and how that can bring a direction and an anchor, how we can see how um, you being loved immensely by your father gives us hope as well as we are loved. And Lord, thank you that we can participate in your mission in expanding your kingdom because that's what you call us to do and you've gone before to show that we can do it. We're grateful that uh, you know us, see us, and love us in ways that are beyond our comprehension. And so for our church this morning and for everyone who's listening, Lord, we say thank you. Thank you for loving us in ways that are powerful and true. I pray this in your name. Amen. Hmm. Well, thank you, church, for being a part of our morning. Uh, If you would stand, I'd love to give you a closing benediction out of just 2 Peter. And it simply says this, may you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen? Amen. Have a great week.